documentary, another intriguing explanation of UFOs was given to us by an ex-FBI informer now living in Perth. A research physicist, what he has to say is what he believes to be the truth. It is so staggering, we felt we should extend this program so that he could be heard. The scientist believes that man holds the secret of anti-gravity and can produce flying sources at will. We interviewed him at a private house in Perth. Well, originally I didn't start to uh, investigate UFO phenomena. Um, I suppose I started studying the physics that led me to this point, 62 to um, 64, at the United States Air Force Academy as a cadet in a special government program. As you're aware, the Air Force Academy is outside NORAD in the, the Colorado Mountains. It's a few miles up the hill from it. And I was trained there with um, 180 some odd other characters uh, to uh, do research in areas of um, electrogravitics later. Uh, we were programmed with libraries of information by slides flashed up on a wall at the rate of 200 pages a second. We couldn't even read them, but they were being implanted in our minds subliminally. It was a very classified project, and for the most part of it, while we were being programmed, we weren't aware of what was going on. We, we had normal classes in uh, physics and uh, calculus and this sort of things, but this stuff was being programmed in so that we had to assimilate it or bring it to our conscious mind over the months and years that followed in dreams and uh, kind of uh, um, daydream periods during the day when we're awake. But um, oh, I left the academy in 64, I had a top secret security clearance with the government, and then eventually that lapsed to secret. And I did a bit of time in the reserves, Air Force Reserves, with the Strategic Air Command outside of uh, Fort Worth. And then um, I proceeded to uh, do private research in this electrogravitics, uh, thinking that I had uh, cracked the secret of anti-gravity all by myself and jumping up and down in my father's labs and mines in, in Dallas. And um, one day I was approached by the government uh, in a kind of a an emissary from Dr. Edward Teller's office, uh, Dr. James R. Maxfield. And he told me uh, what I'd been doing in my lab and the details of stuff I haven't even written down or told anybody. He knew, and um, he had other people like myself sponsored in uh, this kind of research around the country. And that was the first time that I knew that the U.S. government was actively involved, had been, and was still actively involved in the uh, control of gravity with electricity. And who did this man represent? Well... His job, uh, as his job qualification is, is he's the director of the James R. Maxfield Radiation Research Clinic in Dallas, Texas. The uh, same Maxfield that uh, invented the irradiated thread treatment uh, for uh, cancer of various organs. Um, if you look at his little dossier that's in the who's who, you find that he was uh, on the president's National Security Advisory Board, which is uh, really a rather important nog in the U.S. intelligence system. Uh, Kissinger would have been on the same rank. Um, you find that he uh, was closely affiliated with Dr. Edward Teller, who was the um, kind of dubbed the father of the hydrogen bomb project in the United States. But he told me that Dr. Teller was the head of uh, anti-gravity research there, uh, had been, I don't know whether he still is, and that he had worked on a similar project with him. In fact, the uh, letter that you and I uh, viewed uh, earlier from my files from Dr. Maxfield to this government and to Sir John Williams uh, did mention that fact, if you recall. So what happened to you then? Well, um, they suggested that I finish my research in Australia. I uh, wasn't enthralled with the idea, but uh, Dr. Maxfield told me that uh, I would be paid to come down and that uh, I was to call the Australian consulate in um, San Francisco and ask for Bob Gray and tell him that, uh, in these words, that I was a member of Maxfield's party. At the same time that uh, I was being approached by Dr. Maxfield's party to come down here and finish my research, I'd been approached already by the FBI and was working for them as an informant. It doesn't mean that you're a trained agent. It just means that you're somewhere in industry where they need someone. They don't have time to get them in there. Informing on what? Well, the particular thing I was to inform on was the comings and goings of various people from the White House to my group of companies in uh, Dallas and also their connection to Israel and the Middle East political situation. Um, and I did my job uh, rather well, just reporting who came and went and various uh, amounts of money and things that I didn't know that transferred. Um, 
there were about seven or eight hundred of us uh, in the United States that were um, uh, employed by the FBI in this manner. I didn't take money. I took information in exchange. But um, at any rate, they came and told me, the FBI did, that uh, I'd been compromised uh, by a break-in in one of their agencies in Louisiana or someplace like that, and that I was going to get shot, and uh, which they'd explained to me at the beginning, the, the risks involved. But uh, I thought they were joking until I went back to the, uh, uh, the office, uh, the computer division there in Dallas, and uh, was sacked, given 30 minutes to clean up my desk and leave. And... Uh, by an old friend of mine, and so he accused me of being the head of a big spy ring and all kinds of stuff. And so I left. And uh, in fact, I didn't have my last meeting with the FBI, and I didn't have my last meeting with Dr. Maxfield. I just uh, bundled a few things and the family into a plane and uh, headed for Australia. I did make it, and I was quite, quite glad to, and uh, kept a very low profile for seven months. But I continued to do my research, and I wrote Dr. Maxfield a letter, and that was perhaps my mistake. I said, look. I've done it. I've figured out the wave uh, equation that we were looking for. And again, in my ignorance, I didn't realize how much work had already been done and gone before me. I was just kind of on the periphery or the edge of this whole development. That's a device to be able to make things like flying saucers mm. fly, is it? Yes. Also, it's a device to store um, energy in the form of motion, uh, like of a, uh, a small star or a big atom. It's called... This is a long word, an MHD plasma, magnetohydrodynamic plasma, like ball lightning, and it contains itself. But it's a way to turn all sorts of electricity into a high-voltage battery. Now, this would have been an immediate solution for the Middle East uh, uh, oil blockade at that time. Now, um, I wrote the letter uh, in good faith trying to say, look, we can stop the threat of war in the Middle East by using this as an alternate energy source. It's very portable, it's non-polluting. It had some byproduct radiation problems, but things we could solve. It would be cleaner than fission or fusion. Now, that's when um, people here in this country, uh, at the aeronautical research labs, uh, politicians started to get a hold of me. ASIO contacted me. Good grief. Uh, an odd infinitum uh, chain of uh, intelligence people, including two CIA people from the States. Uh, and then the FBI eventually started looking for me in this country, and... Uh, that, again, was after the intelligence war over there, after Hoover died. Um, and I was uh, unable to finish my research in this country. In fact, I met many dead ends in government departments and research facilities where they told me privately, like uh, uh, Dr. Tom Keeble in the aeronautical research labs. He told me, yes, we know about the flying saucers your countrymen have built and in England and in Canada. And, in fact, we have film records of them here in the RAAF uh, files. I said, well, uh, I want to stop you there. Yeah. Are you saying, Stan, that there are such things as, let's call them flying saucers, but they are built on Earth? Yes. Uh, that doesn't mean that I um, rule out the possibility of other flying devices or intelligent beings visiting the planet either from uh, the oceanic bottoms or uh, deeper areas or uh, from other areas in space. But I am positive that we have the technology, I can even name you the companies and people involved, in making high-speed electric aircraft that do look, strange enough, like a, a saucer. What sort of proof can one furnish for that? Oh, good grief. Uh, the briefcase I've got down here is uh, full of documented evidence that is not all secret. Um, if you go to, uh, to the, um, the records of the New York Herald Tribune, the newspaper is now defunct. I think it's being stored in the Wisconsin um, State Historical Society. Uh, and look for November 20th, 21st, and 22nd, 1955. There are three articles in the series on uh, anti-gravity and the various companies and people involved in the research in the United States, Japan, Europe. The list is uh, like a who's who of nuclear physics. It was written by Ansel E. Talbert, the science and aviation editor for the New York Herald Tribune at that time. You can look there. You can look in the um, electrical engineering index for that period between 55 and 58. That's a long time ago. Yes. 57, about uh, March, the security curtain went down. And there were, at that time, over 100 published universities and organizations, including the Gravity Research Foundation, which is still operational in Gravity Village in the United States. There were over 100 of these things operating to develop gravity, uh, the control of it as a power source and communication and, and uh, locomotion, etc. Now, in 57, the blanket went down with security, and there was no more reported uh, news on it to say either that 
it was a dead-end uh, research avenue, that everybody had stopped working on it, or that it was highly successful and there had been a few breakthroughs. There was just nothing. It went quiet. And if you go back in the period and look, you will see that for a number of years after 57, there was no mention of this sort of research in print. Behind the scenes, there was a lot of discussion, and even Walt Disney's, sorry, MGM Studios made the uh, movie The Forbidden Planet, revealing at that time a lot, as though it were fiction, of the technology and why it had to be covered up. I think Walter Pidgeon started that, and he did a good job. Prepare your minds for a new scale of physical scientific values, gentlemen. Basically, they decided that mankind wasn't ready for it yet because he'd proceed to misuse it like he had the uh, atom or the hydrogen bomb. Now, recent evidence is very hard to get. However, in this country, a little leak occurred over here with William H. Martin in the Nation Review. Um, May of 1973 or 4, I believe. I, I can't remember now. Um, he... Um, published an article on Pine Gap and how Nixon had intended to use it in 1975 to uh, solve the energy crisis by announcing a new method of electromagnetic propulsion which would be based uh, from the Pine Gap facility. Well, now, from my knowledge of the, of the technology, what small knowledge I do have from my uh, little viewpoint, uh, Pine Gap has all of the inherent uh, uh, descriptions necessary for a high voltage, low frequency, power broadcast station to broadcast electricity to various receivers like cars and submarines and uh, aircraft that are tuned to that power station. It's just a more efficient um, version of the Exmouth facility here at the Northwest Cape. Um, so it's, <clears throat> it's right here on our doorstep, is it? Oh, yes. The big question you have to ask yourself, uh, Guy, is why would such a thing be kept secret? I mean, People at the levels that are covering it up, uh, I, I know some of them uh, personally, and they aren't, in my opinion, villains. They're very uh, sincere humanists. They are trying to solve planet Earth, uh, trying to bring unity their way. You speak of them as though they were, they were collective rather yes. than singular. Is that right? Yes. Um, Dr. Keeble, uh, as I mentioned before in uh, Melbourne at the Aeronautical Research Lab, tried to explain to me about they, he mentioned we as though it was they, an organization, a group of scientists, uh, academics, industrialists, he, he couldn't be exact. Now, he never put a name to it, but I said, well, do you mean like a club? And he said, yes, but no. Um, we are aware of these problems, and we're trying to solve them in the best way we know how. Uh, granted, there are things that should be kept uh, from the public eye, until we do have some sort of a unity in the world economy. Uh, but I think the manner in which it's uh, been uh, gone about is most unfortunate. Uh, I would not have taken the same tag myself. The power politics involved in keeping the secrets that we now have across the planet have allowed, well, in my opinion, groups that aren't uh, capable of handling uh, control of the planet to take power. So what basically you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that we've got a situation where you maintain various countries have perhaps a top-level intelligentsia who are in possession of a common set of facts which yes. which transpose country boundaries now and it's a worldwide sort of yes. thing. In Russia, uh, involved in this would be the Russian physicist who's been in the news recently uh, with the civil rights movements, Dr. Andrei Sakharov. Also in his country, uh, an ex-KGB agent, some 25 years, but a physicist, and uh, a former uh, hydrogen bomb uh, project uh, development engineer, or sorry, physicist, is uh, Dr. Bruno uh, Pontecorvo, working on gravitic engines in Siberia. Um, as I told you, in the States, it was uh, Dr. Teller and affiliates there. I don't know all of their names. But uh, these people have all been working together as um, scientists who go above governments. And 
look, they're sincere. I can't blame them for doing this. It's just that they have lost control of what they tried to set up. H has that association got a name? I don't think so. When I worked with the uh, FBI, there was a political and financial institution that I was um, ordered to investigate with many other agents, and it was called the, uh, the Illuminati, which is a general term meaning the enlightened or the uh, wise ones. Um, it, uh, the investigation of this led me to the Council on Foreign Relations and to the Club of Rome, which are linked by joint directorships under Carol Wilson. Um, this is, again, another tale, but you put yourself in the scientist's position in the mid-50s. What you see is that you've got a technology that, if announced to the public, would cause mass reactions in the economy, in social moves, and in, in cultural reactions that could probably bring about the demise of the whole human civilization. A simple example would be this. As a scientist, you come out in the mid-50s and you say, we have a process which will allow us to get rid of tires, allow us to get rid of the petrol engine, hence the petrol, hence all the uh, dependent industries. Uh, it'll be available for you in 24 months' time, and it'll only cost you three or $4,000. Now, what kind of his right mind would buy a new petrol engine car if he could have one of the new ones in two years that don't need roads and uh, run on electricity and no uh, petrol necessary? They'd all stop their buying trends, which would then collapse the economies that would be building the other one in 24 months. If you had a central world authority uh, like Dr. Pache's Club of Rome group want, then if you announced, when you controlled all the nations and the economies, if you announced and said, uh, we've got a new car that does this, nobody would panic because they know that if their industry became redundant, they would be retrained and paid while they're doing it in some other support industry. We don't have that uh, facility on the planet at the moment because we're greatly disordered and many of the cultures fight against each other. Scientists, industrialists, engineers found this problem in the mid-50s. Now, we're playing their part. So we sit here and we say, how do we get world unity? The United Nations, the League of Nations had failed. You couldn't get any two or three of them to agree to turn their sovereignty over to a third party. You couldn't come out and field an army from the United Nations or League of Nations or any, anywhere, even a corporate army, and tell the people of Earth you're taking over, as some people have suggested the multinationals might do. You can't do that because the mass resistance would be worse than uh, the French resistance to Hitler. It would destroy the unity they were trying to get. So by peaceful discussion over the uh, conference table and by force, it wasn't possible. Yet as the scientific community looked at this new technology, it reached into all human endeavor, touched many points of life. They said, look, if we develop this, completely develop it into a social, technological, integrated model, away from the rest of people in islands or in back rooms, however we do it, keep it quiet even from the politicians, at some point later, after 1956, 57, 58, some point later we'll have it ready to announce to the world as a global system. Then all we've got to do is figure out how to convince them to give it a try in unity. Right. Well, this, this was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Are we now saying that this is approaching the time? I think we are. And it's not like some prophecy or something. It's just looking at events in the media. For the first 10 years of that 20-year period you're talking about, people that saw UFOs or flying saucers were nuts. They were played that way in the media. It was a bad thing to even talk about it. Now, toward the end of this 20-year period, if you see one, you're a great guy in the neighborhood. Everybody wants to talk to you. Everybody wants to know you. Pilots, physicists, all kinds of people are coming forward now. Presidents, dictators, yes, I've seen a UFO. Now, to me, the shift in the public conditioning uh, medium is to get people ready for the announcement of the new technology. Now, scientists aren't going to come out, industrialists aren't going to come out and say, okay, here it is, children, here you go. The new model for planet Earth using this technology must be independent of any established government or order. It can't be Russian or capitalist or dictatorial. It's got to be independent. And the only way you can do it is a, an external culture, whether it be called from the ocean bottom, uh, whether it's from the Bermuda Triangle or whether it's from outer space. They have got to see it in this way so that for a short time, the masses will overlook their cultural differences to unite, to form this one world order. Then, after seven or eight years, if you can hold the ruse that long, you explain to them, this is how we brought peace. I still maintain, I don't think that it'll work because at the top, these organizations are fighting. I'd like to ask you a direct question. You work in the field of anti-gravitics. 
Could you make what we call a flying saucer? Oh, yes, with adequate funds and time, sure. Uh, I'd still be doing it uh, for the research organizations if I hadn't differed in philosophy. That's where I got in trouble because I stood up and said, why are you doing this? And uh, it wasn't for me to know. UFOs, if they don't exist, or these electric flying saucers, uh, if they don't exist in our current technology, I'll give it to the world. I'll be a hero, but I'll tell you right now, I don't need to do that. It's already done. This does not mean that in the past, before 47, 49, whenever the first flying saucers were uh, supposedly sighted on this planet, does not mean that the time before that was uh, to be explained by Earth technology. It wasn't. Even back in the Bible, in uh, uh, Moses' encounter with God, uh, in the flaming bush, and uh, don't uh, walk on this ground with your shoes on, take one off. It sounded like he was in a field at any rate. Uh, Ezekiel's flaming chariot. Uh, you go back thousands of years and you find we had encounters with things that could only be explained in their own words as being from the heavens. In the last 2,000 years after the uh, birth of Christ, we find that uh, these encounter cases were, uh, many of them more bizarre, where they didn't have the same good side to them. Uh, people uh, suffered headaches, uh, some cases disappearance, livestock were uh, cut apart and the blood drained out of them. You see it quite frequently now. It seems as though the more recent uh, contact cases from these extraterrestrial origins have been malevolent or bad, whereas the Old Testament versions were benevolent or good. We do have the technology now to um, give UFOs or the electric flying saucers to the world. It is a, when I say we, it's a joint scientific effort from many of the countries of the world, Russia, the United States, England, Canada. Now, it is just the manner in which to announce it. What we have here is the tip of the iceberg with the anti-gravity device, the flying saucer we've been discussing. There are many other things that the technology offers. New medicine, which allows limbs to be regrown through electric field processes and plasma research, uh, bioplasma, the uh, uh, tissue uh, re restructuring. We have uh, devices which can transmit power around the entire planet without wires so that you can tune to uh, electricity stations like you would tune to a radio station, but it would run your house or your caravan or wherever you are in the bush or the water or the air. We have theory now, but I don't think any practical devices that would allow us to go faster than the speed of light and traverse many light years of distance in a very, very short time using the same technique that we used to break the sound barrier where we warp the shock wave. Perhaps this is where Star Trek developed their terminology, Warp Factor 1 and Warp Factor 2. We have devices to make weapons, which is an unfortunate thing. It could be used for other applications, but in transmitting power in little hand or backpack units or even um, on tops of uh, the decks of ships uh, that shoot smoke rings or charged particle rings like smoke rings at targets long distances away and strike them with uh, enough force to uh, electrocute or burn the target depending upon what frequencies are used. There are numerous things. There is even a way to use this process to control mines at a distance of 10 to 15 miles from a center, central transmitter where people aren't even aware of it during their sleep. Some what like post-hypnotic suggestion. This in the wrong hands is not a good tool.